My guest today is Lana Lovrincic, who works at the Office for Photography in Zagreb and is a founding member of the Kosakomis Working Group and is uh, active, among other things, in editing the Kosakomis newsletter, is also a member of the program committee for the upcoming conference. And I want to talk to her today not only about her own research interests, but about the institutional context in which she is working in Croatia and about larger attempts to build intellectual networks across post-Yugoslav space. Welcome, Lana. Uh, hello, Misha. Thank you for having me. So I would actually like to start with uh, this institutional question. You are, uh, in a sense, unusual, I guess, uh, but in other senses, um, maybe very typical in that you are not actually based at a traditional academic institution. You're not at a university, you're not at a research institute, you work at an NGO. So how does that affect your research and the way that you interact with others in memory studies? Uh, well, actually, I started working in NGO during my studies. And uh, from the beginning, all of my work was in a way connected uh, not only with the possibility and will to research, but uh, with the will to change, to actively engage with the issues I was handling. So I started actually first with the pro, uh, projects that were dealing with the urban justice and uh, urban planning in uh, post-Yugoslav uh, space. And then in 2010, uh, I had an opportunity to start uh, working in this project about the this destruction of a uh, uh, national uh, liberation army this is people liberation struggle monument so called partisan monument in uh, croatia and this was large bulk of uh, monuments built from after the second world war till the 19 uh, i think that the last one was in 1981 um, and then during the 90s they were being destroyed, uh, systematically uh, organized in most of the cases. And uh, from uh, around 6,000 monuments, half of them were physically destroyed. Otherwise, uh, other were faced with uh, changes that include uh, changing uh, of their scripture, for instance, all of people in Croatia or nation in Croatia was changed to some more ethnic uh, um, ethnic meaning people, Croatian people and so on. So the, the part of uh, brotherhood unity and this all nations that were living together in uh, Yugoslavia, this whole narrative was being dismantled through, through, uh, through destruction and uh, remodeling of these monuments. So um, I started doing this research and this ended up in this um, exhibition where we actually mapped the difficult, uh, different ways in which the monuments were destroyed during the 90s. And that included also some, uh, uh, of course, in Croatia, there was war going on and some of the monuments were destroyed uh, by the, uh, the armies, uh, but a lot of them were destroyed by the Croatian army. So it was not just collateral war damage. It was, uh, it was something that was going on for many, many reasons and by the Croatian, uh, probably by Croatian government, not maybe direct uh, influence, but they were okay with this process. But when you say systematically destroyed, I mean, it sounds like there was actually a central government decision to get rid of these monuments, but the way I understand it, it was actually much more complex than that, right? It was sometimes, yeah. as you said, just army units uh, essentially trying to get rid of monuments that they saw as standing for a socialist kind of internationalist non-ethnic past. In some cases, I guess it was local communities who held a similar ideology and wanted to get rid of them. But in some cases it was just individual activists or groups of people who just acted on their own. Mm. Yes, this is everything uh, was combined, but um, in Croatian um, um, constitution, the anti-fascist uh, past of Croatian state, as well as the, the legacy uh, from the Second World War, this is 
something that is part of the Croatian contemporary Croatian state's constitution. So this is not, the destruction of this monument was not something that uh, uh, was directed by the government because it would be anti-constitutionalized. But it wasn't sanctioned. And uh, there are a couple of, uh, couple of cases that in the uh, National Assembly, some, uh, some politicians did raise questions about the monuments. Some lawsuits were made, but nothing ever happened. And uh, then you had this whole national uh, government, because when uh, I started to, to research the question of the destruction, the question that arose after that was the question of protection, because all of these monuments were protected as national monuments by the law. And when the law in the socialist state changed in the 90s, these monuments were not cut out. They were still uh, uh, protected by the law. Um, and so the question was, if this is something what is protect, uh, that is protected, why the, the local government and the central ministry of culture is not doing anything for that. Then I realized that there is no central regis registration of these monuments, which is something that was not even done uh, uh, during the Yugoslav period. The whole system of protection and of um, not only protection, but of their revitalization and mending and putting on, um, I don't know, candles and stuff in the, the commemoration days. It was so intertwined with the um, self-management system and the way that the local, uh, <coughs> local uh, municipalities and local governments were managed in the Yugoslav period that during the 90s, this whole system was collapsed. And uh, then it was really easy for some military units, some political uh, uh, parties, uh, it was easy for them to go and to destroy these monuments. Uh, maybe most notorious example was the, is the monument of uh, uh, Bakic in um, Kamensko. Uh, which was a 31 meter high uh, abstract monument. And if it would be standing today, it would be probably the biggest abstract monument in Europe. And it was done by uh, nine engineers and this uh, uh, military unit that tore it down. They, it took nine tries for them to mine it, to, to tore it down. And for instance, in Makarska, which is one part of Croatia, 98% of monuments were destroyed. Uh, some people said, that is police uh, uh, collection say it was somebody unknown, John Doe destroyed the monuments. But local people say that it was some immigrant from this uh, Southern America that is connected with Ustasha and so on. So you had this different political actors doing that and the state actually said it's okay because they didn't sanction anyone. Nobody was ever sanctioned for, for destruction of monuments. And there are photographs on web where you can see people who did this, this uh, deed. So you started talking about this research project in response to my question about your work at an NGO. And if I understand correctly, this kind of research and exhibition project would have been very, very difficult to undertake at a state institution in Croatia. So the fact that yeah. you did this based at an NGO actually helped you do the research. Yeah, so this was uh, 2010. I was invited uh, by a colleague of mine and she was connected with Serbian um, Council in Croatia. So the project was connected with Serbian community because throughout the period, it ended up in Croatia that only anti-fascists were Serbs and not Croats, which is some narrative that was being imposed on us. So they were able to, to have such a project, uh, but the financing came from uh, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. So it wasn't possible to be funded in this way uh, inside of some Croatian uh, institution probably. Uh, but also this allowed us great uh, liberty in our research and we were actually held back only by the institutions from which we were looking for documents and photographs that we needed for our research. Um, 
the good part is that uh, most of this documentation was not considered to be really important. I mean, there are photographs that we couldn't get hold on because the museum that we asked said that they don't have them anymore. And uh, for instance, in Croatia, there was this big, in Yugoslavia, there was this big web of uh, uh, monuments dedicated to, to partisan movement and socialist revolution. And all of them were changed after the 90s, most of them were changed into city museums. And so these museums, they have different kind of uh, internal structures and the collections inside of these museums are differently built. So it is not easy to get to some photographs that were, that were before in collections that were called partisan struggles or something like that. So this was problematic, but when we went to the national archives, we could get hold to different kind of, um, notes from meetings and assemblies that were dealing with this kind of monuments. Uh, and especially when I started uh, uh, researching the legislation and the development of a law on protecting uh, uh, monuments, this was completely open for me, but no, because nobody researched it, nobody knows where the documents are. And of course, some things I got by chance or by recommendation. For instance, um, we have a national um, uh, register of uh, protected monuments in the Ministry of Culture. But the monuments of, uh, dedicated to partisan struggle are under revision since the beginning of 2000. So they are not online because uh, local uh, uh, offices got instructions to find all of those monuments and to say which of them really are artistically and historically significant monuments. Because they didn't do that, uh, those monuments were never put up. But what is also a problem is that most of those monuments were not, not most, but part of those monuments were never protected during Yugoslav period with document. They were just uh, uh, protected. Like if this is a monument for partisan, it is protected, but you don't have documentation about the, the specific one. And uh, which is something that I found really interesting and exciting is that part of those monuments were not protect, protected as cultural monuments, but as uh, landscapes and um, uh, natural spaces that were protected because of their historical values. Right. So this, you've been talking mostly about Croatia so far, but I know that this research project also gave rise to what became the Inappropriate Monuments Platform, which has participants from all over former Yugoslavia and whose conference in 2017 that I was lucky enough to participate in had uh, also people from other post-socialist countries, not just in the Western Balkans, uh, but also beyond. So maybe you could say a few words about how this platform emerged and what it's doing now. I mean, one of the problems when we talk about um, phenomenons like these monuments, their protection, their building, everything, um, you cannot do it without the, the broader cultural cycle and then and the state in which they they were done. So uh, researching these monuments without talking about Yugoslavia and without communicating with our colleagues in Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Slovenia, Macedonia, and so on, uh, didn't have much sense. Because mm, the reason why these monuments were destroyed in Croatia and in part of Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, in why they are becoming Serbian and national monuments in parts of uh, Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina is because uh, wars of the 90s amongst other motivation and uh, goals that they had to achieve, uh, they were actually dismantling this whole narrative of brotherhood and unity. I mean, you had uh, uh, people that were living together for 45 years and you had five to 10 years period in which you had to dismantle this narrative of brotherhood and unity and in great parts of Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina where most of where the war happened, you had to turn neighbors against each other and this monument they were carrying these messages and they were, uh, uh, they were not only remembering uh, 
people that died from that village, but they were remembering that the people from Croatia and Serbia, people living in the same area that were Croat and Serbs, that they were fighting together against uh, fascist and Nazi occup uh, occupants, so occupators. So this was really important message and they, uh, these monuments, they were also carrying the idea of modernity in themselves. What I found really interesting is that you had some small villages in uh, central Croatia where uh, before uh, the end of the Second World War, you had maybe a church and a small village, but when they were building in the 50s monuments commemorating local heroes and this great victory in the Second World War, they were built to form first public square in this village and then near it they would build also a common house for people that was not connected to church and to this but to this idea of uh, so modern socialist uh, state and this was this uh, center of this new socialist city or something and there is this interesting example in Užice uh, I read this uh, nice research that is saying that this is a, it, it is a place in Serbia, a small town and it's heavily destroyed uh, during the Second World War. And when the rebuilding of the place started, it began around the monument that was commemorating the, the Second World War. So this monument had a lot of different functions inside of the society. And when you drive through Lika, which is uh, part of Croatia that was uh, also occupied in the 90s and it uh, was severely, it suffered terribly during the war, you have these empty squares without their monuments or part of the monuments still standing there. And in other places where Croatian society is uh, particularly uh, nationalized or the political party in charge is uh, from the right specter. You have those places from older monuments, the older monuments were destroyed and then new nationalistic monuments were put in their exact place. So, um, I mean, you can see the power of monuments in the, uh, of the 20th century for the Second World War here being still very strong. And in Bosnia, when you look at some cases, you, you have uh, two commemoration uh, parties coming to monuments that were preserved. For instance, this uh, monument in Tjentište, which was one of the rare monuments that was a uh, monument of the whole Yugoslavia, not of some specific republic, because monuments were diff differently uh, arranged are there state or republic or local monuments? So on, a long story. Uh, there you have two uh, veteran partisans unit doing commemoration. One partisan, uh, one uh, this veteran uh, assembly is talking about all the nation. The other assembly is talking about only Serbian victims that died there. So they're still very strong and. Um, I mean, this is the reason why also all of us that were dealing with those monuments had to come together and have to put our you know, uh, minds together and rethink them. Because in 2010, I don't know uh, if you remember, one foreign photographer came first, I think, to Croatia, then he went to Bosnia and to Serbia and photographed those monuments. And then he put them on online and they were called Spomeniks. And in that moment, then they became this symbols of modernist uh, monuments that came from above from I don't know out of space and were landing in this undeveloped land and uh, nobody knew why these monuments were built that the state and the republics and the people gave a lot of money for these monuments to be built and that they're commemorating second world war I mean with this is great. And here nobody was dealing with that because it was not so uh, politically opportunistic. So as often happens, it was in a sense of the foreign gaze that pushed people to look at these things in, in greater depth. So Lana, yeah. as you know, I can, I can talk about Second World War memorials for uh, yeah. <laughs> days and days, as can you. But since time is limited, I wanted to touch upon one more aspect of your research that I find really fascinating. You've looked uh, also historically and through archival research 
at uh, the phenomenon of uh, internal or inland tourism in socialist Yugoslavia, and specifically the role that memory played there when people started establishing uh, hiking trails that were called partisans trails. So maybe you could say a few words about how those developed and what their function was in socialist Yugoslavia. Well, so what was I? Uh, what I found really interesting when I started uh, exploring this uh, legislation and uh, mechanisms that were used to protect the monuments, um, the question of how to uh, to get money to finance these monuments and when they when they are built, how to to pay for for this you know, for for cleaning and so on. One of the ways uh, that um, local communities took care of their monuments was being, uh, was being through the development of different touristic offers. So in the 50s, um, the idea of this um, domestic tourism in Yugoslavia, it was uh, and building of workers, uh, places for workers to go and to, to uh, go to the sea and to have their holidays there. It was really strong in the 50s, but really early on Yugoslav uh, government saw that this tourism on Yadran is source of uh, currency. And because of that tourism uh, at the Adriatic became too expensive for blue collar workers. So they started developing something that is called, uh, that was called inland tourism and which was focused around beautiful natural sites. And in most of these cases, uh, these sites were connected with uh, localities where partisan struggles took place and later where uh, monuments were being erected. And already in the 50s, and also we had this contemporary socio sociological uh, debates and research about the importance of uh, shorter vacations for the workers. Uh, and there was this national campaign where workers were actually, um, they were, um, uh, it was recommended for them to go to shorter, uh, uh, shorter visits uh, outside of the uh, urban centers. So they made these little hiking places and their, these little uh, resting places yeah. around big uh, industrial centers. And then they would build a monument there. And you have this already in the 50s, the previously mentioned monument uh, of uh, Vojslav uh, von Bakic in Kamenska. In 1961, seven years before the monument was built, you had this uh, sh sh short uh, article of um, a place with uh, benches being built there for people to go there. And you said, and in the future, a monument will be uh, built there as well. So this is one part of this inland memorial tourism, tourism which started to develop. And then in the 70s in, and in the 80s, uh, they included these monuments inland in tours from, for instance, Beograd and Zagreb to the Adriatic for uh, more wealthy uh, tourists from, uh, the, uh, from domestic tourists. And they would say, okay, if we're going from Beograd to, I don't know, Zadar to spend your holidays, you have to check this monument, that monument, and so on. Since the nature of partisan struggle was, uh, especially until uh, capitulation of Italy, uh, it was not urban struggle during the war, it was struggle in uh, open land, in forest, and so on. Uh, during uh, the 50s, there uh, the idea to commemorate also these uh, little uh, parts, uh, not little, uh, big parts of woods and forests where partisans were marching and so on. Um, it uh, emerged as this idea to do these partisan trails. It was actually initiated by the military because it also had some military value. But uh, it soon became really important in this uh, recreational uh, uh, hiking, uh, um, hiking uh, activities for broad society. So you had these hiking trails and different parts of hiking trails, these checkpoints. They were marked with little monuments. You, you could have a little stone or maybe some bigger monument. 
and bigger monuments in the forest, such as Petrovagora monument, for instance, were part of these hiking trails. They were shorter or longer. Um, and this was a way also to introduce uh, different, um, different kinds of uh, 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 people to monuments. For, uh, for instance, um, younger population, uh, school children and students, they were involved in something that was called uh, something, Boy Scouts, something like that. And uh, we had Pioneeri and Izvijaci, and they would go to hike throughout these roads and they would get these small uh, mountaineering booklets with every of this checkpoint. When you come to a checkpoint, you have to get a stamp that you visit actually this checkpoint. And then you would have a small description what happened at this checkpoint, which partisan unit passed here or some significant bat battle that happened. And uh, since everything was self-managed and republics had really uh, big, um, uh, the process, the, the, every republic for, were, was, for instance, uh, writing their own books for school and history books. So in this period where you didn't have some kind of um, official history of Second World War, where if in the 60s you still didn't have some, some parts of Second World War being introduced in the school, uh, this was some way to educate young people about partisan movements and about partisan struggles in, in the woods. Right. This, this is fascinating, Lana. And um, as you know, I could, I could listen to you talk about, um, about Second World War memory and memorials for hours. And I think in particular that it's really an amazing field for comparative research, because of course there were very, very similar phenomena in many socialist countries in the post-war era. Uh, I'm thinking of the Soviet Union, where there were also others with very interesting parallels, also very interesting differences. And I'm sure that both at uh, the conference in, in September 2020 and on other occasions, we will have uh, many more opportunities to talk about this. Uh, for the time Hopefully. being, thank you very much for uh, this interview and also for all the work that you've been putting into our working group. And I will see you online and maybe in person very soon. Thank you. Bye. Okay.